Hello and welcome, I'm Arumba. thank you for joining me. This is uh, kind of an update video on a campaign that I've been doing on Twitch and also in my spare time. So a long time ago I tried doing the, the Three Mountains Ryukyu campaign and we ended up quitting that series because uh, there was a major patch or something and uh, never really revisited it. However, there was a post a little while back on Reddit about a guy who had done it without exploits in 1.18 and it got me thinking about it again and uh, so I've been, I've been iterating, and I'm on, I think, run number 4 or 5 now. It's the year 1569 right now. And I just want to give you a snapshot of where I'm at, and kind of how we got here. If you want to watch this campaign and follow along, um, I have been streaming it on my normal streaming schedule times, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard. I am going to be playing this again uh, live on Thursday, which is two days from today. Nope, that's not true. One day from today. Today's Wednesday. Um... So you can do that. Not everything is going to happen in the stream. It's not just a campaign I'm only playing on the stream. But um, I am, like I mentioned, I'm iterating. So we've actually played, I think, two or three different campaigns so far on stream. We've started over a few times based on um, what we've learned and how things have gone. So let's just talk about the basic opening moves. Uh, as Ryuki, you start off with five development. And there's a little tiny province here called Okinawa. And with 5 development, you don't really have much going for you. You barely even make enough money to support an army, let alone have any advisors or anything. But there's a few key advantages in 1.18 compared to previous versions of the game. Most notably, institutions. Um, used to be that Ryuki would start off in the Chinese tech group, which meant they had a plus 60% increased tech cost, which really, really slowed you down, made it very difficult to actually get any idea groups out or uh, keep up in tech. From there, the goal was usually to try to westernize as fast as possible, via either expanding, conquering a colony, getting adjacent to uh, the Portuguese core of Goa, which they usually end up with because of a uh, uh, an event decision that they can take, or just colonizing and trying to get down adjacent to one of the colonies that they may have formed. Now you don't really need to do that. With institutions, you actually have the ability to knock out Admin Tech 5 very quickly, because at the start of the game, you're effectively Western Tech. So you immediately start off with no tech cost penalty, so you can very quickly focus Admin, Knock out two administrative idea levels, then switch your focus to Diplo and try to get um, exploration ideas out very, very fast. So that was the opening move in this campaign. Um, once getting exploration ideas within about 13 years of the game start, start colonizing in locations that are going to give you some more some more finances, right? I mean, just colonizing this province in particular, it's, it, it doesn't start out at 38 development, but uh, it's like 10 or 12 or something like that. And um, from there you expand until you have a little bit more of a power base, get a little bit stronger. Then you start to conquer some of these little one province miners over here. In this specific iteration, I've gone for a, a strategy where I am vassalizing any nation which has colonists as part of their national ideas. So in this case, turn eight here, uh, one of their national ideas, the looks like the third one, is dominance over the outer islands, which gives them colonists plus one. Same thing with uh, Tidore. They also get that same set of ideas. So um, I'm vassalizing people who can colonize, hoping that they will continue to fill in all this territory for me. And so far, they've uh, they've done a little bit. The problem is that they don't really have a lot of uh, increased colonization speed or anything here. It looks like he's colonized two provinces, I think, so far. And now he's down to here. One of them is. This looks like, uh, who is this? Turn 8, yeah. So he's only got plus 20 per year. And I am playing in the beta patch, so unfortunately, settler growth gets the worse the bigger the colony is instead of getting better, which really slows down colonization a lot. Um, you start off with a much higher coloner colonize chance than in the beginning than when it gets bigger. But they're doing a good job. Um, after that, I colonized, uh, I conquered these two countries. There's a country here called Makassar and a country here called Bhutan. I conquered those guys just because they're easy and then I recently integrated them. But um, they don't have colony uh, col colonists in their ni national idea set, so I didn't keep them around. However, I also vassalized a little nation here called Sulu. He's also almost the exact same color as me, so it's hard to differentiate him, but he is in here. He doesn't have any colonists yet, but he will have one when he gets his 21st idea. His final, his finisher is a colonist. Same thing for Bruni, who is, this, again, the same idea set. So I'm going to have four vassals that can colonize, and uh, I'm going to keep them around probably for quite a while. Right now I have a temporary vassal down here called Sunda, who I released from Majapit, and he is just conquering land. I'm going to integrate him after I'm done conquering the remaining cores, or the remaining claims that he's fabricated for me, just a few years. So, after doing those opening moves, the next set of ideas was to go for uh, humanist ideas. You start the game off as animist, which is a tribal religion. It's not very good, it's one of the worst religions in the game, and uh, it's it's very weak compared to any, any of the other real options. The two easiest religions to switch to at the start of the game is Ryukyu are Sunni or Hindu. 
You do that via colonization. You colonize into any province down here, and if, as an animist country, you have another nation, another another a province that has another nation's religion, you have an option to freely adopt that religion as a decision. That decision costs you for stability. So what I did is um, <clears throat> I colonized a few provinces up here to get a little bit of a power base, and then when I had about five or so provinces altogether, I colonized down into one of these locations. Um, I think it was actually probably Barit... No, it was... Katapang, I think was the one that I used. I colonized this so that I had Sunni, and then um, then I was able to take the decision. It took me from, you have to be at positive one stability to take the decision. It took me from positive one stability down to negative three, and then what I did is I utilized um, getting my country broken by rebels to reset my stability back to zero. And the way I did that is uh, I had it engineered such that um, I had an estate in the islands with all the provinces adjacent to each other, and I revoked a province to force, I think it was the Merchant Guild, to rebel. They occupied a few provinces, and then they broke my country. By breaking the country, I effectively turned a negative four stability hit religion decision into just a negative one stability hit. Um, you can also do it where uh, there's something called the Eko Ikus Rebellion. Because we're part of the Japanese culture group, if you have negative stability, there's like a very, very high chance that Eko Ikus will rebel. And if they actually do spawn, then you can actually get a free army as well. But I think I failed to mention that a big part of the strategy in the beginning of the game, in order to even be able to afford a colony, is that you just basically run without an, no army whatsoever for about 50 years. You just delete it right at the beginning of the game. Um, no one can attack you. The thing is that um, in order to fabricate a claim, you have to have direct adjacency or adjacency via sea tile. And you'll notice that Okinawa is in the center of a sea tile, except for one other nation which borders him, which is a vassal underneath Japan. Since, Vana since the vassal is not going to declare outside wars, uh, effectively no one can claim any territory on you. Unless you made the foolish mistake of colonizing one of these provinces, in which case Ming could kill you. But um, you don't do that. So no one can ca attack you. There's no point in having an army. You just uh, ignore that in the beginning of the game. So, so yeah, I flipped to Sunni. The choice is between Sunni and Hindu. Uh, Hindu is pretty appealing because Hindu, you have a, a deity you can worship, which gives you min minus 10% coring cost. And at admin tech 8, there's a national decision you can take, which reduces your tech cost by 6%. I ended up deciding to try out Sunni this time around, though, because with Sunni, you have the piety system. Um, so you have morale of armies, which is really valuable. Uh, missionary strength, which is not not, not really that necessary in this case, because I have humanist ideas, but it can be useful. But the reason I went Sunni is because you can go to negative 10% tech costs from lack of piety. My plan in the late game is to, um, I'm going to conquer Sunni nations, but I'm going to leave them with one province. And I'm going to use them, and like once every five years or whenever I need to take a tech level, I'm going to attack all these little tiny Sunni one province miners, which is a crime against Allah, which is going to knock my piety down to negative 100. And then I'm going to white piece them. And I'm just going to keep them around on the map until the very, very late game so that I can force my piety to negative whenever I need to. So I can get more money, more manpower, more tech cost uh, on command. So that'll be useful. Um... Outside of that, whenever your leader has 5 Diplo skill, there's a decision you can take called the Islamic Center of Scholarly Learning, which gives you minus 5% tech cost and plus 1% missionary strength. So, altogether between the, um, the technology cost reduction from Piety and then the Islam Islamic Center of Scholarly Learning, we're at negative 15. And then furthermore, as the Sunni, you have a, an estate called the Dimi, which is part of the reason why I went humanist ideas. With the Dimi, if you give them control of provinces that aren't your state religion, they gain influence. And if they have enough influence and enough loyalty, you get an up to 10% tech cost reduction. So altogether, we can get 25% reduced tech cost. With that, I've, I've actually been paying... My tech cost right now for Diplo is 368, and that's one year ahead of time from a base of 600. If I were to wait uh, six more months, which I'm going to, the tech cost would be reduced by 60 down to 308. And I don't even have the Dimi loyal right now, so I could go another 10% lower, which is another another 60. Um, I also have a spy network that I'm building up in Ferrara right now. Basically, I'm expecting current level tech to cost me about 200 points, which is pretty ridiculous. Um, so as you can see, I mean, we're ahead of time on all tech. We've got a, a nice bank of, of points I've been saving up, and we're going to go from there. Mm, beyond that, um, so the main reason for Humanist was to allow me to abuse the Dimi in order to get the huge tech cost reduction. Also to stabilize the transition from Animus to, to Sunni. Also really helps out with the years of separatism, more promoted cultures, better... I mean, everything about it's great. Plus, the earlier in the game you get uh, the idea cost reduction, the more points you save overall. 
Next idea group was influence, because we have vassals, we want to draw more income from them, we want to have more diplomatic reputation for integration, an extra relationship slot. Um, unjustified demands is also incredibly important, because it allows me to take provinces that I want, even if I don't have a claim on them, and expand in ways that I wouldn't otherwise be able to. Next idea group is going to be administrative, because we have to start focusing on coring things. Administrative paired with humanist, no, administrative paired with influence is going to give us an extra policy of minus 20% diplomatic annexation cost taking the total down to negative 45% diplomatic annexation cost. So we're going to pay like, uh, what is it, 8 times 0 0.4, 0 0.55. We're going to pay 4.4 .4 diplo points per, um, per development to integrate nations. And there is an, a random event you can get when you have, um, I believe it's influence ideas, which reduces an integration costs. So I'm going to try to time it so I integrate nations when we have that event up. And uh, I think I can get my diplomatic in integration costs down even further. Beyond that, uh, Ryukyu doesn't really have any like, any core ideas that reduce core costs at all. So, uh, administrative is going to give me minus 25. Um, late game, we're going to be using a lot of administrative efficiency to, to reduce the costs. There's still maybe a play that I might make in the very, very late game. I could make a late game transition to Catholic so that I can become the Emperor. Become the Emperor, pass a few reforms. Once you have the... Uh, the... Where is it? Once you have reformed the Hofgericht, then you can um, you can basically just stay the emperor if you get uh, a couple more. I think you, you, you power your way through some imperial reforms, which is not actually that hard to do if you've conquered a lot of the land, because you just add land to the empire and then you pass some reforms. Once you've done that and you've made it so that you are always the emperor, which actually I think you have to go all the way down to revoke the... Nope. Uh... Doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, you have to go all the way down to Eber Kaisertum to make it so that you can always be the same... Oh, you'll always be the leader no matter what. So you get all the way down to there, and then you can actually flip to Coptic, which will give you another minus 10%. So you could turn into a Coptic nation in the late, late game. So that would give you minus 10% from the HRE, and another minus 10% from being Coptic, plus minus 25% from having uh, administrative ideas. So in theory, I could get minus 45% core creation cost. I don't think it's going to be worth that much effort. I'm probably just going to end up using lots of diplomatic annexation, since that'll be the cheapest method of expansion for us. Uh, let's see, beyond that, after administrative ideas is going to be probably diplomatic ideas, for the extra diplomat and relationship slot and diplomatic reputation, province war score cost. Lots of good things come from that. I think there's a few policies that I want to use. Um, let's see. Yeah, Administrative, the Record Keeping Act, an extra diplomat, better envoy travel time, that could be useful for claims and integration and all kinds of other stuff. After Diplomatic is probably going to be some military ideas. Um, offensive, defensive, quality, quantity, one of those choices, I'm not sure yet which. But, um, and by then the game should hopefully be over. So right now the year is 1569. I am already uh, rank 3 great power. I've just passed France. We're close to passing the Ottomans. As far as institutions, that's another big topic that probably we should, we should talk about briefly. How did we get here? Uh, well, we were able to embrace the first institution, the Renaissance, by developing Okinawa. I saved up a lot of points and then I got the merchant guilds to be very loyal and high influence. Um, and then I was able to knock out tons of development in the province to force the Renaissance to spread. By doing that, I was able to avoid any tech cost penalties. And because I didn't actually have any borders with anyone, for a very, very long time, the Renaissance didn't spread. This spread actually came from Western Europe. It didn't come from me. And you can actually clearly see that with colonialism. Notice how none of this has colonialism. I've sheltered it from them by intentionally avoiding having borders across sea tiles that they could get. Unfortunately, I recently did give it to my vassal who's given it to him. But uh, here you can see that, again, the sea tile borders were sheltering this, these institutions. Annoyingly, I recently expanded into Japan, and uh, I am giving them institutions, so they're going to on, catch up on tech soon. But my plan moving into the mainland of Western, uh, sorry, of Eastern Asia is to use vassals to shelter it. If you'll notice here, um, I have a vassal here. No, it's not a good example. Who are we looking for? I have a vassal somewhere who doesn't have the tech. Uh, let's see. Colonialism, no. Printing press... No.
Basically, being a vassal doesn't give you the same spread as if you owned the land yourself. If you owned the land and you've embraced the institution, it will spread to all your provinces, no matter what, even if they're really far away. But your overlord having the institution doesn't guarantee it that way. So if I vassalize, say, Ming, which is part of the plan, by the way, I've been tracking him very closely. He's on 144% war score cost, and he's losing two wars. If he falls below 100, I'm going to go vassalize him. I've got a relationship slot open for him right now. Um, if he gets full annex, then I'm going to attack Min and release him. Um, from in here. And by having a vassal on there, um, I can again still continue to shelter the institution spread. So, what else? Let's see. So, that's how we got the Renaissance. Colonialism, I actually birthed. I, I was the one who did it. And I, I paid 250 admin points to move my capital from Okinawa to another location over here. The birthplace of colonialism cannot be on an island. So, by moving my capital, I met all the criteria. And January 1st, 1500, I birthed colonialism. So that was actually really powerful, I think, because it prevented Europe from having it for a very, very long time and potentially weakened their tech growth, which is really nice. Printing press, same thing as the Renaissance. I had to buy it. So I bought it up in my new capital, Manila, which is why it's at 38 development. And then the plan moving forward for the other, uh, the other institutions, we've got um, global trade. My goal right now, um, I actually, this is, if I were to reiterate again, I would, I would do this. I recently, just recently, moved my my diplomatic, like my trading center, to the trade zone of Malacca, thinking that in order to spawn global trade, I needed to have. It was based on my my capital center, like my my trade center, but when I moved to to uh, Malacca, the criteria to form global trade is still Philippines. Philippines is where my capital is currently located. So what I should have done is instead of moving my trade capital, I should have just moved my actual capital again over here. And, and ideally, even at the very beginning, instead of moving to the Philippines, I should try to colonize inside Malacca somewhere so that I can move my capital here originally. And that way I can meet the colonialism res uh, requirement and the global trade requirement with one move instead of doing two. But again, that's a further, that's a, the next iteration if I were to do it over again. So my goal here is I'm going to small on global trade. I'm going to move my capital again into Malacca. I'm going to turn Malacca into the most powerful trade node in the world which right now we're pretty close to. Uh, Malacca's already in second place, and it's going to keep on getting bigger. The way that we're doing that is that we're actually forcing as much of the wealth from uh, the New World as possible back into Nippon through Mexico. So I'm going to continue to expa expand into Rio Grande, um, expand into Mexico. Any expansions that we do into California um, are going to end up coming back into our area. We're just going to make it the biggest node possible. Um... Beyond that, a lot of these other nodes you cannot force backward, so we're going to try to avoid expanding into them too much, just because they don't help us for our immediate purposes. And by colonizing this area, we're just giving more wealth to Western Europe, and we don't want to do that. But um, so far, I've already got most of Ryukin, Mexico established. We've got a very, very small vassal in California. Um, my next set right now, I've actually got uh, ships on the way to go and engage the English. I'm going to start taking over their colonial nations so that they're colonizing for me instead of them. I wouldn't mind them being the wrong religion because it doesn't affect me. You know, if anything, it just makes it easier for me with uh, the Dimmy. So, so that's the plan for the next institution. The institution past that. Manufactories is going to be pretty easy to, to trigger. We just have to be, just have to build some manufactories, which we have tons of money for. Part of the reason that I have so much money is that I've been milking all the Native Americans, which has been nice. And then finally, the Enlightenment. Uh, we'll get there when we get there. Probably just build a university is all we have to really do. So... We're solid on those, but um, anyway, that's that's just kind of a status update on where I'm at with my Ryukyu campaign. Uh, again, tune into the streams if you're interested in following along, and uh, at the very end of the campaign, uh, if I do succeed, I am going to do, do like a timeline video to show kind of how we got there. I just didn't want to record the entire campaign again, not knowing if I would be able to do it in time, and not knowing how many iterations it would take. You know, I didn't want to do uh, Ryukyu, Three Mountains, Series 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 10, you know, like Season 10, like I don't, I didn't want to do that, so... Anyway, I feel pretty confident about this. I know there's a lot left to conquer, but um, you'd be surprised. You'd be very surprised at how fast you can conquer things with this specific set of ideas and uh, some administrative efficiency and the imperialism CB in the late game. Most World of Conquest stuff is going to happen in the last 100 years. And right now the game plan is all about establishing ourselves as a great power, getting ready for that. And uh, I think we're in a very good position to do so. So... Anyway, that's where we're at. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this little summary, and I look forward to seeing you on Thursday night at the stream. I'll see you soon.